You would think when America's most hated woman goes missing, it would be front page news. However, it took a year before anyone reported Madeline Murray O'Hare missing and in the end, a horrifying case of kidnapping, theft of nearly a million dollars and four dead bodies would be revealed. If you enjoyed this twisted case of revenge and greed, please like and subscribe. The Murder of the Most Hated Woman in America On August 27, 1995, Madeline, John, and Robin Murray O'Hare left in the middle of the day without saying a word to anyone. The family left their passports, three dogs, and Madeline's diabetes medication. What no one knew was that Madeline had run afoul against career criminal and former employee David Waters, a man so dangerous that he once beat his mother half to death with a broomstick, then urinated on her. Why did David Waters kill Madeline and her family? But before we could get into that, we have to talk about Madeline. Madeline Murray O'Hare's claim to fame was taking prayer out of school. More specifically, she sued the Baltimore public school system for requiring prayer and said that it violated her son's William First Amendment right. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1963, the court ruled 8-1 to in favor of Murray and the decision ended Bible reading and prayer in public schools. Madeline absolutely reveled in being the woman that got prayer out of schools and publicly provoked the Christian majority. Even though she made herself champion of the unreligious, the people that knew her personally didn't like her. She was crude, vulgar, and abrasive, and every sentence was punctuated with a swear. She was also a bully even to her supporters. Madeline moved to Austin, Texas in 1963 and immediately became a thorn to the Christian community side. In a two-week span, she stormed into a church bingo night, flipped tables, then declared it illegal. In Bryan, Texas, she canceled a debate by telling the Christian crowd to go to hell. Then she went to Tyler, Texas, riding a broom, and introduced herself as that atheist witch. In 1964, Life magazine declared Madeline Mary O'Hare as the most hated woman in America, and she ran with it. In a God-fearing America, she was like a comic book villain threatening the very fabric of America's status quo. Madeline loved the notoriety and being on TV, and she was a ratings hit. As a result, she became a regular on the talk show circuit in the 70s and 80s and appeared on The Phil Donahue Show, The Tonight Show, Crossfire, and many others where she would regularly debate religious leaders. By the 90s, Madeline faded from the spotlight and founded America Atheists, a civil liberties nonprofit group that she led with her youngest son John and her granddaughter Robin. At this point, she had disowned her son William because he became a born-again Christian. It was difficult to keep staff on hand at American Atheist because John, Robert, and Madeline yelled and belittled the staff. She started hiring ex-cons and her son William believed she did that because ex-cons were more likely to put up with the abuse. In 1993, she hired ex-con David Waters to work as a typesetter for the American Atheist newsletter. Madeline, who was notorious for being a difficult person to work with, took a liking to David almost immediately. Waters proved himself to be a talented typesetter and earned Madeline's trust so much that he was promoted to being the office manager whose duties included taking care of the organization's finances. But not long after Waters was promoted, expensive computer equipment went missing as well as bonds from the office safe. When the Murrays came back from a trip to California, they discovered that Waters had laid off all the staff and stole $54,000 from their bank account. Madeline pressed charges and instead of getting jail time like she wanted, Waters only received probation and had to pay the money back. She was absolutely furious that he was given such a light sentence, so she made it her mission to ruin Waters' reputation. Madeline published several articles in the American Atheist newsletter revealing not only the embezzlement but also that he was an ex-con. She even implied that he had homosexual relationships in prison. If he wouldn't get prison time, then Madeline wanted to ruin his life. Madeline wasn't a frail old lady and she wouldn't back down from a fight. However, in her pursuit of revenge, Madeline had underestimated how dangerous Waters was. By the time David Waters was 17, he had already killed a man. In 1964, David and several other men beat a man to death with a fence post because he wouldn't let them borrow his car. 
Then, in 1977, he got into an argument with his mother, then proceeded to beat her with a broomstick, throw her down the stairs, then threw wall plaques at her head. And as she laid cowering, half dead on the floor, he urinated on her. Once David Waters saw the articles Madeline wrote about him, he seethed with rage. He told his ex-girlfriend that he wanted to torture Madeline and cut off her toes one by one. Foes weren't the idle threats of a disgruntled ex-employee. They were the promises of a dangerous man. Waters recruited two men named Gary Carr and Danny Fry to enact his revenge. On the day of the kidnapping, the trio forced the family out of their home by gunpoint and forced the family to share a two-bedroom hotel in San Antonio with their captors. With the Murray O'Hares in his clutches, he was going to drain the family dry. Knowing that you could catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, he promised the family that all he wanted was their money and that if they were obedient, he would let them go. And for a month, the family complied with the hope that they would be freed. Waters made the Murray O'Hares empty their bank accounts and max out their cash advances on their credit cards. Then John was forced to buy $600,000 of gold coins in September 1995. The kidnappers then moved the family to another hotel. And given what he did to his own mother, we can only imagine the horrible things he might have done to Madeline, Robin, and John. Once they were no longer useful, the men strangled the family to death. Their bodies were rolled up in a blanket and loaded into a van. The kidnapper swept over the room, finding the notes Madeline hid in the hopes that someone would find them. Then the kidnappers drove to Austin, dismembered the bodies, and stuffed the pieces in three 55-gallon drums. Now, you would think when someone this well-known and infamous goes missing, that it would be all over the news and that there will be people looking for her. Well, you're wrong. Because of Madeline's nasty reputation, everyone assumed that she and her family stole the money and went to New Zealand since they had bank accounts there. With Madeline vanishing into thin air, Ellen Johnson took over leadership of American Atheists. Looking through the records, she discovered the missing $600,000. She even spoke with Madeline several times after they went missing, which only bolstered the assumption that they took the money and ran. The police were told about the missing money, but the family's disappearance wasn't treated like a missing person's case. It was Madeline's, a strange son William, who finally reported his mother, brother, and daughter missing. After a year of not hearing anything from his mother, he filed a missing persons report in 1996. He also thought his mother stole the money, but after not seeing or hearing about her on the news for doing something or saying something outrageous, he knew that something might be wrong. Because the police were still convinced that the family stole the money, they weren't actively searching for them. The case didn't get any traction until an investigative reporter named John McCormick learned from an anonymous source about the missing money. Further digging revealed that John's Mercedes-Benz was sold far below market value at $15,000. McCormick and a private investigator located the car's new owner. After they showed him a photo of John, the buyer told them that wasn't the man that sold him the car. Around the same time that the Murray O'Hares were murdered, a headless torso of a white male was found dumped in a Texas river. There was no way to identify it, and so it was buried in a pauper's grave. It would be two years before the connection between the torso and the Murray O'Hares were made. In 1997, John McCormick received a tip from Danny Fry's brother about the Murray O'Hares. He told John about how Danny served time in prison with David Waters, and was working with him at the time of his disappearance. So, why didn't Danny Fry's family go to the police? Waters' violent reputation was so well known that the Fry family was afraid to go to the police. An investigation into Fry's phone records showed that Fry and Waters spoke multiple times while the pair were in San Antonio. Fry also matched the description of the person that sold John Murray's car. Despite all of the information that McCormick was gathering, Austin police were still not interested in opening the case. In October 1998, McCormick came across a story marking the third anniversary of a headless torso that was found in a Texas river. Recalling the conversation he had with Danny Fry's brother, McCormick had a hunch that the body might belong to Fry. A DNA test would confirm McCormick's suspicions. The headless man was Danny Fry. When Waters' ex-girlfriend Patty Jo Steffens read about Danny Fry's murder, 
she called the FBI and gave them three invaluable clues. One, she told them about Waters' hatred for Madeline and how he wanted to torture her. Two, he rented a storage unit at the same time that Madeline went missing. And three, David Waters and Gary Carr suddenly had a lot of cash on hand thanks to selling some gold coins. In 1999, the police got a search warrant for the storage unit. Even though the unit had been cleaned with bleach, they were still able to find some blood under an aluminum floor track. Testing showed that the blood was a combination of Madeline and John. The police then searched Waters' apartment and found 119 rounds of ammunition and a bone saw. As a convicted felon, he wasn't allowed to have guns. With that evidence, David Waters was arrested. At the same time, Gary Carr was being interviewed in Michigan. At first, Carr refused to speak, but after listening to the information that the FBI had on him, he decided to talk. He signed an affidavit implicating Waters' involvement and confirmed the gruesome outcome. In June 2000, Gary Carr was found guilty of conspiracy to commit extortion, traveling interstate in order to commit violent acts, money laundering, and interstate transportation of stolen property. He received two life sentences, but it was reduced to 50 years in 2021. David Waters took a plea deal in January 2001 and pleaded guilty to the four murders in exchange for telling the police where the bodies were. He was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. In March 2001, Madeline, John, and Robin were found after 21 hours of digging in a remote location in Camp Wood, Texas. Their bodies had been dismembered and mutilated so severely that the police had to use dental records and Madeline's hip replacement to confirm their identities. In a bag next to them was Danny Fry's head and hands. And that brings us back to Danny Fry. Why did Waters and Carr kill him? Well, Danny Fry was a raging alcoholic with a big mouth, and loose lips sink ships. Carr and Waters didn't think that Danny Fry could keep the secret, and so they killed him. And while Waters got his revenge against Madeline, he would never be able to use all of the gold coins. In an ironic twist, a group of storage unit thieves stole nearly all of the gold coins out of their storage unit just five days after they were purchased. On January 27, 2003, David Waters died of lung cancer while serving his sentence. In 2001, Madeline, John, and Robin were buried in unmarked graves in Austin, Texas. Thank you for watching The Twin Files. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us with the algorithm.